care. So that's, I think, why we need to work well together. Um, so um, a solution to this is sitting next to your developers when you're working on a project um, and making sure that you're implementing things well. My favorite thing that I learned this year was that um, if your designer doesn't like have like a super, super strict mock-up and it's kind of a little more loose, when you're developing it and iterating it, it can be a lot more efficient to just kind of get things done while sitting next to them and making decisions as you go. Um, having most of it figured out, but having decisions as you go, um, it gets things done a lot quicker. So um, I think the best thing when you're uh, learning how to communicate with someone is, is finding your similarities. So I went through and these might be wrong because I, I don't develop a whole bunch, but um, here are some things I found. Um, is that we both pay attention to detail. Um, we, uh, predict, programmers predict the little things that can go badly early on. And as designers, we usually do the same thing. We, we predict how the user is going to interact with something. Um, we both have empathy. Um, programmers must create code that others can easily maintain and understand, and that they can easily understand and maintain themselves. And um, UX designers must analyze the experience that the user will have. Um, and then, I think we're both creative. I think programmers are often given that credit that they're creative, but they totally are. Um, they must mix what's already been done with something new and better and constantly be innovating. Um, and we do the same thing, UX designers. Um, and if you want more information, UX Magazine has Andrew Wagner's um, articles about this, and then it'll be fascinating if you're struggling to into the relationship between programmers and designers at your job. So now I'm gonna go, um, Let's come together. Yeah. But um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how designers work, and we work in detail. So I'm going to teach you a few tutorials about how to be more detail oriented, um, and show you first some examples of why uh, details are important to us. So um, there's this thing called kerning um, in design, where letter space and matters. Um, just to put the way it might look like something else if you're not careful, or um, there's uh, today's hit music. Um, may look like you don't have great music on your station. Um, and that's why we care about the little details, is because if you're not obsessive, you can have some real tragedies. Um, so we're going to start with Illustrator. Um, I don't know how you guys work in your different offices, um, in your different teams, but with us, we have an Illustrator file, and the developers can come in and interact with it. So um, the very first thing that I think it's hard, it's like location um, and sizing of things. So if you don't have your design around and you have Illustrator, you can just open it up and this is how you can work it. So um, this is an app we're working on, it's called Basebox, it's for kids, that's why it looks very childish. But the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go to Window and then you're gonna go down to uh, Transform. Then it's gonna pop out this side over here. Um, can you see that? It's kind of small. Um, and as you click on different things and move them around, um, it'll tell you the width and the height of the thing and the position on the X and Y axis, which is really, really easy if you are trying to get something exact and um, you have it all there uh, mapped out for you. Um, and then this is the color and stroke bit. So um, that's how you tell color. This one's a little bit confusing, I think, for people. Um, it's not too bad in my mind, but um, if you click on something, it's going to show you the color over here on your side and it'll give you the RGB. Um, the hex code is the one with like the number sign next to it, of course, and um, you can just use that. It's also up at the top. Um, I think that's what confuses people. That's mostly for us um, designers. We like to be able to see different colors and things, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but this is where the stroke is. It's the empty one because it's the outlining bit. That's how I remember it. I actually uh, volunteer and teach some 4-H kids how to use Illustrator. And uh, this, is, this is always what we teach them is it's an outline, so it's an outline. It makes sense because it's empty inside. So um, the font size is like this. Uh, you can click, you can like zoom in onto something. Um, give it a second, it will do it. I pre recorded this. Um, and you can click into it uh, using the direct select, and that's like the black icon, it's pretty easy. And then you're gonna go over to this guy over here, and it's, it's the character, is what it's labeled as, but it looks like a letter, so it is a letter. And you can take it apart there, and you can see the different fonts, um, and like you can see what it's full or not, and what the point font size is. So it's like really easy to take apart. Um, 
Then this is the trickiest thing, I think. Um, masks, I think it's even trips, trips up designer sometimes. What happens is you have different versions of Illustrator, and when you convert them, it creates masks. So you have things that are clipped off really weird. So if you go to click on something, it's not easy. It like, um, I'll show you. It, it basically acts unresponsive. Like right now I'm clicking a bunch, and nothing is happening. Um, oh, this is the wrong slide. I don't know why that works. OK, sorry. Um, you, you can click a bunch, and nothing will happen to it. I don't know why it keeps on doing this one. But um, I can show you in real life, too. Oh, there it goes. So you click a bunch, and nothing's really happening, and you can't see um, how big something is. And you have to like, double click, and it's really messy. So you just have to, uh, sorry, give me a second. You have to right click, and it will say undo clipping mask, or release clipping mask. And then you'll have everything back to order. Sometimes you have to do this like 10 or 15 times, depending on how old the version is compared to yours. Um, but it will eventually get there, and you can click through it, and see the size, and the color is a lot easier. Um, and if you have any more problems, everyone knows about like that. But they have really great Illustrator tutorials there that you can look through and use. Um, now is for web fonts. This is the fun stuff. Um, web fonts are a pain in the butt. I think a lot of times designers, they don't realize that you need a web font um, instead of just like a normal font. Um, that's something I have a lot, um, but you do. So I want to teach you guys how to use Google fonts. I'm sure you've already seen this. Um, but uh, what you do is you can go to Google fonts and they have all these different categories that are kind of confusing, so I'm going to run through with you really quickly what they are. Um, I'm sure you guys know what a serif is. It's like the more decorated font. Um, this is always a funny joke we have in graphic design that you shot this serif. Um, and then this is a sans serif, and you can tell the difference between the two because one's cut off and one isn't. So when you go to select it, if you're trying to compare a font that a designer's already given you, if they have like this sort of hanging style, then that's a serif, and you can click on that option. Or if it's a sans serif, um, you can click on that other option. Um, there's a, a weird thing in here uh, called display. Um, a lot of people like to use this for body copy, which is like the copy that you're reading, right? So um, you're not supposed to do that. Display is, is mostly for titles. It's really like kind of almost fancy um, and eye-catching and kind of annoying in my opinion. Um, but this is kind of some examples of it. Um, there, you can use the titles. I think that uh, Pack 201 is actually pretty okay, um, but all the rest are pretty ugly. Um, and then the mono space isn't really something you should know. Um, I'm doubting any designer will give you a mono space font that you have to use. Um, but basically, it just means that everything is perfectly aligned as usual in like science and math and like coding applications. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like. It's kind of like janky. Um, oxygen's okay, but the rest are pretty bad. Um, so just as a quick tutorial, this is Gotham. This is a, most designers, some of their favorite fonts. I really love it. I think it's beautiful. Um, and so finding uh, the similarities between this and um, fonts that you already like have in web fonts is kind of challenging, and the best way to do it is you can go in here and modify it to sans serif because it doesn't have like the weird hanging things, right? Um, and you can go in and like change the thickness and how straight it is and slanted, and it will come up. Um, another easy trick you can do, like everyone does, is just to Google it. Um, so if you Google it and say like, what's an alternative web font for this one that I've been given, it will just tell you what it is. Um, this is Monistrat, and it looks pretty simple, I think, uh, similar to like uh, Gotham, so it's pretty, Great. Um, and then here are just like a few uh, resources. We have codeschool.com and Hack Design. Hack Design is amazing. It's one of my new favorite sites. It teaches you everything. So if you want to learn more like design principles, you can go there. Um, it's important though to remember that designers go through a lot of practice and time to get good at what they do, um, and that programmers can't always be like the best designers right off the bat. It takes time and practice and development. Um, mostly what I want to do is like leave Q&A for you guys because I prepared some tutorials but I really wanted you guys to be able to ask me anything you're struggling with or any frustrations you have with designers that you wanted to know or maybe like tricks on making your site look better. So go ahead and like ask me anything I'll try to answer. That was hackdesign.com, right? Yeah, it's great. 
I designed it to be beautiful too. It's really well put together and really well organized. Um, the UX is incredible. So, yeah. There seems to be some, uh, at least the uh, designs I've worked with, some a split between people who really like to use Illustrator and people who just use Photoshop. Yeah. Why one or the other? And Why do they do that? Yeah. It's a it's a preference thing, um, in my opinion. So Illustrator, and um, I like I prefer Illustrator. That's why I kind of taught you guys in Illustrator. Um, Illustrator doesn't have, yeah, Illustrator doesn't have layers, um, and a lot of designers are going more towards Illustrator. It's not used as much as Photoshop, at least from what I've seen and read. Um, but um, Illustrator, you can just kind of simply click around, and it's really easy to like move things. You don't have to worry about all these layers that are blocked and are unblocked. Um, it's kind of more of a tool for like Illustrators that are like doing well in Illustrator, but like illustration design. That's where it's kind of. Illustrator is also more precise. Yeah, very and precise. you're able to um, you're able to move things and then they'll go in lockstep with other elements on them, and that doesn't usually happen in Photoshop. Yeah. Another thing that they've been using um, that I started to see is uh, InDesign, and that's kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, that's a really easy and beautiful thing to use as well. Um, and you know, I know people give the, like the Adobe products sometimes a bad rap because they're not easy to use, but they really are. Um, I actually, before I started taking design classes, um, I went and just started messing around and I got it pretty easily. So if you guys like want to learn how to use it, just go on and uh, Lynda.com is really good and Hack Design is amazing for like different principles of design. So yeah, any other questions? We've got a bunch of time. I talk really fast when I get nervous. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to interact with our designer, specifically um, the best way for him to deliver access to us. Yeah, actually, I'll show you something. Okay. Here, I totally forgot I had this up. Um, show me. That's what I'm doing. So this is uh, something that's actually a really beautiful tool. It's called Envision. Um, it's IN, and then it's Vision, like normal. And it's free for up to three pro projects, and you can have unlimited people on it. It's amazing. So I can upload a design and to comment on it, I can just click. So it's like, I don't know what this is, and I can be like, you suck. And then <laughs> they will know, or like, does this need to be moved over? It would probably be a more like kind thing to say. <laughs> yeah, where you can say things like, make this 15 with the souls instead, so the designer can change. This is really great, especially if you're working remotely from your designer, because you can just upload your assets and then comment and talk about things. It's really cool too because you can go through like a live thing of it and you can see what it's supposed to be doing, which is really cool and it's really easy for the designer to set up as well. Like when I started using it, it was really intuitive. They have really great tutorials on there as well. It's a powerful tool. So I highly suggest it and it's so well designed. It's beautiful. So yeah. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. I say, I, I, I've been using the support of our other designers a lot, and it's great because when I finish making my changes, I can just upload another screenshot, and she can see instantly what I've done, and then if it needs any more changes, and it's just a really rapid way to to send it back and forth, and, and get and we have a, it documents all of our comments that we've made and stuff like that, so we can see the flow of the work. It, it's super super easy to use, and and I think it's it's a good it's a good medium because you can just. The designer can create something that feels real, so it's beyond like a balsamic mock-up. It's not so vibrant. It's like a real thing, and it has um, actual things that you need. And you can pull out what you need to, like uh, different um, assets from it. So I I think it's fantastic. Does that help at all? Does it work from your assets, like from the uh, from uh, Illustrator. Illustrator? Yeah. So, so I was going to say as well, um, it's not available to the general public yet. By the way, I work at Adobe. Um, uh, it's not available to the general public yet, but it's, it is available and it's coming out very, very soon. Creative Cloud, as part of the Creative Cloud, it has an entire file sharing structure behind it so that you can share documents up there automatically with your teams. Yeah, well, actually, we have them at Adobe at our, at our office, and she was telling me about that. And when it comes out, we're planning on making it a try. So, be exciting. But for now, Vision's great. So, and, uh, yeah. Um, we have some kind of chronic problems dealing with our designer and getting him 
to demonstrate the interaction that's desired. Okay. How do you uh, show that for your developers? Like cover state, what should happen when you click on XYZ? Yeah, um, I think Vision is great for that as well because you can just like click on different things. But um, as a painting designer, um, you should probably talk to them um, about UX design and be like, listen, if you're going to do web design, you have to do UX design and really focus on the way things interact and the way things are grouped as well. But in, in your in your comps, how do you show how what the interaction works. should be? So this comp works that way. So like, if I click on this it's going to go to the screen to write it. Does that make sense? So Vision is actually really powerful then for that tool as well, where you can go and show the place. Uh-huh, and you can see how it's going. It's really, like, it's so easy for a designer to set up. So I would suggest having them look, look at this tool and, and have that. Um, and then if they have any, if you have any questions for your designer about the way it's supposed to interact, you can look in comments on it as well. So, so I'm kind of into Photoshop and it's all that. I've been working with a designer who likes to do a lot with bays and all these little minute details oh, and stuff. You. And so um, I showed, you showed us the color picker and like how you can find the hexco and stuff. But I also found in Photoshop you can copy the CSS of the specific elements you're targeting. Um, it's, but I've noticed that it's not always accurate as it's to what you're getting. So do you know anything if there are a better way to actually get the CSS that might be marking that up? I wouldn't, I wouldn't use what's already in Photoshop personally. Um, no offense to the testing there. That's all right, no. Okay. Um, but I would, I would look at it. Um, here, I'll show you something. It's going to say trial version because my computer's being weird lately. I promise. I promise. I promise there was a screw up in, in all the things. So um, let's open up um, Maddie. We can open up Maddie. I'll show you. I'll show you gradients. Um, so, excuse my artwork. I have a lot of thoughts, and I like to do things a million times over. So I have a bunch of crap on there. Um, what was the so this is where the gradient panel is. Um, I need to slide this in a bit. Sorry. Okay. So um, you can click on it, and it's this. This guy right here, appearance, you can get that in the window too. But it will actually tell you exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, if you click on on it, it will show you like if it has a drop shadow or if it has anything else. Um, I'll add something to it so you can see. We'll make this really ugly for you. Um, it's going to probably be awful. Let's do a diffuse flow really badly. We'll make it be classy. So, um, you can click on it now, and you can click on um, the glass, and it will show you everything about it. I guess that's not a good example here. Let's do a drop shadow, yeah? Um, there we go. This is probably something you'll see a lot of. And you can click in here, and you can see where it is. And then you can see all of the information with it. So you can see what the X offset is and the Y offset. So. It's pretty, I don't know, I feel like that's pretty intuitive. Um, as far as gradients go, um, they're located here. Sorry. Um, while, she's, like, while she's pulling that up, if you look into Adobe Edge Animate, it comes with Creative Cloud 3. Um, it's, it's essentially what Flash Professional was, but instead of compiling to a Swift, it compiles to HTML and JavaScript and CSS. So you can put shadows in, you can do whatever you want to do inside of there, blur effects and everything, and it will translate into optimized CSS and JavaScript for you. It's called Edge Anime. As far as like gradients go, too, like you can, if you want to do it in Illustrator, it's just pretty simple. You can look at the location of the gradient, everything, all the data's in here. And I say just kind of do it by hand instead of using what they give you. But yeah, okay. Any other questions? Have you ever heard of the, there's a few designers that I've worked with over years that have always mentioned this term of designing the browser? Uh huh. Have you heard that term? Yeah, yeah. So there's a bunch of designers that have come to us like, oh, I really don't think it's designing the browser, but I don't know enough about CSS or like, you know, the bare bones HTML and JavaScript that I need to know to be able to, you know, build mockups in the browser and sort of with the tools that we know that 
our developers if we build any stuff in the lab that was, did our did our developers already have a, a hand? So the, there's not so much translation between oh I use you know some gradient that's harder to map in you know CSS and I yeah. in the data system browser. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I have. Um, well, it's kind of what I was talking about actually earlier in here. Um, I think the best solution. Oh my gosh, I've got a picture up. We can have some visuals because I'm all about that. Um, the best way to do this, like design a browser, is if they're next to you. Um, we actually like. I think it's really important to do this. Um, a lot of times, we'll we have our designers separate from our programmers in different areas, and we'll be like working on something until it's like a quick mock-up. And then we bring it over to them and we start and help design it in the browser. We don't have like a super rough, rough cut of it. Because if you do that, it's like everything has to be exact in this and you don't know what's possible as like a, for like the developer side of it. So if you kind of have it like easy, you can design in the browser with your programmer if they don't know how to do that themselves. But I don't know, I think it's it's smart for designers to know a little bit of HTML CSS. It's gonna make one of my programs really I said that, but um, not all do because that's not like our first priority. Yeah. But yeah. Have you heard of any tools that, are that would do that? I know that Adobe has something, don't they? Yeah, it's called Muse, M U S E, and then Adobe Edge Animate. Or both but. of those work really well. Cool. Muse is actually pretty powerful. Yeah. Anything else you want to ask me? I have a question. Yeah. So, one of the things I've noticed with a lot of programmers who Actually, don't focus on front end design, whether it's mobile or web apps, is, is we'll, we'll get something from the UX team that's really well thought out, really well designed, and then they'll go to implement it and they'll do it and they'll be like, yeah, that seems about right. And it's like not even close, right? Like, yeah. you know, the sizes are wrong, the font colors aren't really right, it's not even the right font face. And like, how, how do you teach, like, you know, and maybe it's the whole right brain, left brain thing, but how do you teach these, these people, like, that's just wrong and you should be able to look at it and tell us what you've yeah. done wrong? Um, it's, it has a lot to do with respect, right? Like earlier, I kind of briefly went over, um, you know, saying that we are kind of similar and really like doing that. The best, the best thing is, is you have to have a really good team. You have to have, to have a team that respects what each other does and not stepping on each other's toes. I think it's actually hard for designers sometimes because you will come to something and it looks completely different. It's like, why, why did I even spend time on this? And it's frustrating. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to make sure that both teams respect each other. So I respect what can and cannot be done, and they respect what I did, if that makes sense. And that really has to do with like, collaboration and keeping an open conversation. And I think sometimes we get a big ego, I struggle with this too, in, in producing things. Like I think a lot of people who are in the tech world are really smart, right? Like we're all kind of brain faces, and we can get a little bit cocky about it. Um, and I think the best way to do it is just be really open about communication, and make sure that there's like this fluidness. Does that make sense? So it's like, yeah, like it doesn't matter that this isn't perfect because I know it's really hard for you to implement, but you should implement it maybe a little bit more like this and just like working together and speaking side by side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? I was just wondering. Yeah. I'm sure it depends on you know, where you put that, but where I got from designers, it could be certain things for you. They met us, they, instead of us going to them, they met us up here, so we don't have to go up there. Like, it's already there, we just go. Yeah. So, you can go either way. You know. Sure, sure. Cool. Anything else? I'm sorry, I talked really fast. I like brought like 40 slides and was like talking terribly quickly. But so, I've, I've worked with half a dozen different designers, and everyone's had their own work and their own way of doing things. Um, Recently, three of the six designers I work with um, have all switched to Sketch because uh, they used to use, I don't remember what it was called, some other product that was related to some of um, And they use Sketch app. I, I'm curious how common that is or if you're seeing that in your I mean, as well. I haven't been with Sketch at all, I'll admit to it. I've heard about it, but it's not something I've used a lot of. I mean, Really, the, the way that a designer comes to something is is very particular to the designer. I mean, um, when you're creating something and you have ideas flowing, um, everyone interprets that differently and does things differently. As, as I'm sure everybody programs differently as well. 
Um, and they use different things to achieve different Why flat design? Hmm. Oh, I'll explain this. Actually, I know a lot about this. I can't tell what's a button anymore. When I open up a new, whenever I open up an app on my iPhone, and it's like now it's the new flat design version, I'm completely lost, and I can't figure out which is text and which is buttons and which is a highlight. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's actually part of the movement that's going on right now. Um, designers kind of decided that um, they wanted to they were sick of things looking real because you are looking on a tech device and they wanted what's inside it to mimic what's on the outside. So like if you're holding an iPad, why does it have to look like exactly perfect? They're trying to make it look more like its surroundings. Does that make sense? So that's kind of where people are going that a lot of us are thinking that's probably not gonna stick around for too long and there's probably gonna be like a combination. I'm not for against flat design, I think it's kind of neat, but um, I, it's, it is tricky because there are like weird button issues and I think the most beautiful designs are somewhere in the middle, you know? Not like, and like the old iOS was pretty bad. Like they had like weird textures on everything and it was like really tacky, but I do think there is a problem with buttons. I mean, I've encountered that a lot with designs that I've done and had to like modify a lot. So, does that make sense? It's just, they're just trying to create something that fits onto the device it's on. That makes no sense. It worked perfectly well before, and I could tell which thing was a button. <laughs> it's just designers trying to be artistic. <laughs> they should use art next time. Yeah. Sorry. Well, that, that, it, the point is, it's in the context that it's on, right? If you're on a, if you're on a screen, it's a flat screen. And so it's kind of like blending into the surroundings or using the theme around you type of thing. Whereas before, it's skeuomorphism. Where like you know how you had uh, when you opened up the Notepad in I, um, the original iOS uh, iPad, it had like the leather stitching on it and all that kind of stuff around it. It made it look kind of almost like realistic. You can still function it. Right, but, I mean, you can still you can yes, and uh, but it's just a, it's a design choice, right? One of them is yeah. trying to do it to make it mimic something in real life, and the other one is trying, like she said, to stay true to the device. Right, to stay true to. The Right? It's just a different theme. Like you have different skins on your browser, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I think too, I, I mean, there is issues with buttons and things like that, right? But I think I think eventually, this is what happens in design history and art history, is it swings back and forth really rapidly. It's like for real. And, yeah, until it gets to a point where it's like, okay, we found the happy medium. And I think that will be coming soon in the next few years, but it's not there yet. So I'll have to suffer through not knowing what a button is and what is not. Any other questions? You can ask me anything. Yes. So, and, and I think you've already posted some of these things, but I, you know, I'm a, I'm a front end developer and I'm really passionate about that. And I generally just consume what my designers give me. And I'm very passionate about trying to create exactly what they have done, you know, in the web browser or, you know, on the mobile app. But what are, what are techniques that I can use as a developer to be better at actually potentially creating those myself? Do you have any tools or like, or I mean specific links? I mean, I think you kind of cross through a few of them. But yeah, I can, and you know, and, and then maybe you can post these somewhere and I can go look at them. Yeah, I'll, I'll post them and I'll get with you maybe like after this. Okay. And I can put them on like a blog or something. Um, yeah. yeah, hack design's good, and then code school's good too, I think, because they're kind of more on the programming side and they come from a programmer's perspective and kind of teach you things that way. But I think. I think the best thing to do when it comes to design and becoming a good designer is is to see things that are out there and kind of do them, but don't don't mimic. Like find your go find your principles and then find your voice and really create things that you love and you're passionate about, even if it's not like a a website, even if it's just like some like weird funky poster that you came up with. Like go just like design the things that are in your head and get them out and like start messing around and you'll eventually like find your way. It just takes a couple of years of practice. But um, cold school and hack design, hack design is really cool. Like I keep on going back to it, but it really is phenomenal. Like you want to learn basic design principles, they have like hierarchy on there and a bunch of other like things of color um, theory. And I think um, someone was telling me, oh, what is the Skillshare? It has a 33 day trial right now. Um, and they have a bunch of design like, tutorials on there. So 
maybe switch to ten dollars a month instead of like fifteen dollars for for class. So that's another good resource. Anything else? Trust fund. Another good one is uh, the referral site video. It's like first principles of design for programmers. Understand why UI and interface experts do what they do. One of the things suggests is carrying around the design notebook and knowing good design, bad design. And then you know, just taking faith. Like, we'll often realize something is good and bad design without realizing why. And then we can go back and learn about design by figuring out why that's the case. So. Um, I could take you really quickly through the do you guys, would you guys be interested in learning what takes a design from one place to another and kind of what designers are doing before they get to you? Do you want to know that or is that like stupid? Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, here, I'll, I'll do this one. So, this is a project I did with MIT. Um, it was really great. So, this is uh, Brandon. He's fantastic human being. He's really nice. And we talked to him and we had three weeks to build something, which is um, and so we came up with a timeline. Um, that's like the first thing is to like negotiate time of when we're gonna get things done. Um, but as far as designers go, we really like to stay true to what people want and who people are and their characteristics, if that makes sense. So this is uh, actually a bit from the MIT, like, what is that called? Like their yeah, mission statement. And it's that they want to develop in each member of the MIT community the ability and the passion to work wisely creatively and efficiently for the better of humankind. Of humankind. And they do this a lot, like, so, the project we were given was not only for their use, but for the world's use. So it can be a little bit rough. Um, so this is what happens, is we come upon a design, and we look at it. Um, this is it's pretty awful. Um, it's really outdated, and it's really confusing, and this is like a core step, so for when you're going through um, a bunch of different, um, like, figuring out your, your course plan for 